Hey, thanks for joining us online at The Assembly. We believe in biblical teaching and preaching, and this message is designed to proclaim the hope of Jesus. So feel free to share this video with a friend or on your social media. And we would love to stay connected, so be sure to follow our channel. Hope this message encourages you. Welcome to the company of the hurting, the helpless, and the hopeless. What kind of a man can heal the pain with a single soft touch? What kind of a man multiplies hope and freedom as easily as he does fish and bread? Who else can turn our dusty old religion into a brand new relationship? What kind of man would claim to be God in the flesh, but then allow that same flesh to be torn apart? What kind of a man would embrace betrayal, insults, torture, mockery, and death, and yet live to tell about? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. Who could speak with such authoritative words and yet drench them with compassion? Who could be strong enough to still the storms yet be so meek and humble? Who could allow the hands that created the universe to also be nailed into a wooden cross? Who could choose patience despite deserving immediate and complete obedience? Who could be blameless and without fault and still endure the judgment others deserve? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. Who will love us like him? Who will be with us when all others have left? Who comforts us in suffering? Who is our peace in the midst of anxiety? Who reassures me when my mind is drowning in doubt? Who accepts me as I am? No strings attached. Who else would die for me while I was sinking in sin? Who else can turn the grave into Easter morning? Nobody. 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 Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus can do the things that were done. We're in our series entitled Refocus. Last week we looked, on, looked at Refocus on who Jesus is. And today I want us to refocus on what Jesus did. In fact, as you read throughout the Gospels, so many miracles were performed by Jesus, so many lives changed, so many religious views even challenged, and so many captives set free. And who did this? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. And so today we're going to see what Jesus did from the very beginning. And I'm thankful that he is still setting the captives free. He's still saving those who need salvation. And he is still being our Lord and Savior doing the miraculous. How many is thankful that Jesus is still in the miracle working business? So if you wouldn't mind this morning to stand, we're going to be reading Colossians chapter 1. We looked at Colossians last week, and we returned to that passage of Scripture. We'll be reading verses 15 through 17 this morning. I encourage you to bring your Bible and, uh, and take notes. If you ever want my notes to, to use it as devotional or, or to share it with anybody, my notes are not copyrighted. <laughs> Just let me know, and I'll email them to you and, uh, and, and use them if you will. So in Colossians chapter 1, Paul's writing to the, to the church in Colossae. And this is what he says, beginning in verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything and was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything, say that word with me, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Before you're seated, look to someone and say, I love God's word. You may be seated this morning. Jesus Christ did so many things in his short tenure here on earth. In fact, in the three and a half years of ministry, he literally began to change the world. And you say, whoa, 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 
Jesus didn't change the world? No, the world is continuing to be changed because he sent out the disciples, he sent out the apostles, he, he sent out his followers, and he's still doing that today. That's why we covered refocusing on our mission, and that is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples locally and abroad. But Jesus did so many things, and if we're not careful, especially those who have been in church for a very long time, we can take the things that Jesus did for granted, and sometimes we mainly just focus on what Jesus did while he was here on earth and even what he has done in the past in our life. But in our passage, there are a few things written that remind us of some things that Jesus did. And I want us to go all the way back and understand this. What did Jesus do? First of all, in our passage, we see that Jesus, he shaped everything. He shaped everything. In other words, he created everything. He shaped everything. He formed everything. He formed man from the dust of the ground. He, he created everything. We see this in what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For through him, speaking of Jesus, God created, say it again, everything. And I want you to look at this. Everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things you can see and the things you cannot see. Every molecule he created. Every mountain he created. From mountains to molecules, he created everything. And he continues to say he created everything that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. You think that Paul's trying to get across to uh, the believers in Colossae and also to us today that Jesus created everything and everything was created through him? You see, Paul makes that statement several times throughout that passage of Scripture. But Paul's not the only one that teaches us this. The Apostle John believed it so much that in two different places within the first ten verses of the book of John, of his gospel, he states this truth. In fact, just him stating this emphatically indicates that this was so important to the apostle that he wanted this doctrine and, uh, to be known by his readers from the time that the first person read the, the, the Gospel of John until even today when we are about to read what he wrote. He wants us to know that Jesus shaped and created everything. Look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this in this version of the Bible that I'm reading out of. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And from the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, the Word, Jesus Christ, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. Capture that. Not one thing that has been created, that has been shaped, it was not formed without Jesus Christ. The word was in the world, and through, through and though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. Scripture is very clear that Jesus Christ created and shaped everything. What did Jesus do? He shaped everything. <laughs> Look at someone sitting beside you and said, you know what? He shaped you. He shaped you. <laughs> He's still shaping you. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> but Paul also shares in his letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, but for us there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created. Do you see a theme, a continual theme? Jesus Christ shaped and created everything. And when you stop and begin to think about this and what Jesus has done from the beginning of time, it really is mind-blowing. It, it is for my mind when I began to stop and think. I, I love, uh, we, we were talking this past week in our mentoring group uh, uh, with a staff, and, and, and we, were, we were even, uh, you know, asking, uh, and, and any time that we ask, you know, what, how does God speak to you? How does God reveal his purpose in you? And, and last uh, Sunday we had, we hosted our house 
um, the life group, young adults, and that was the, one of the questions that they asked. You know, you know, how do you know that God is speaking to you? Does he still speak to everybody? And, and, it, and we understand that God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. He speaks to us. He's speaking to you now as the preaching of his word is being done. But it came up that God speaks to us through his creation. And Crystal was sharing, she said, I believe that, that I recognize and God speaks to me when I'm sitting on a beach. And I took that as a hint. She's wanting to go to the beach. And I'm like, well, hold on. But she began to see, you know, the vastness of the oceans. And, and the Bible says that God holds all the water in his palm, in his hand. He's a big God. For me, I, I love the mountains. I, I, love, I love even here in the Ozark Mountains. You can go into some of the most breathtaking views. But then when you go to larger mountains like the Rockies and you're, 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 you're driving through the Rockies and you, you just stop and you just look across the valley and see the vastness of the mountains, God speaks to me. And so there's times that we need to refocus on what Jesus did. He created everything. He created everything. In fact, uh, th there's, there's some interesting things I think sometimes we take for granted. You know, even the air that we breathe, he created the sun that rose this morning. How many thankful for the sunshine? God created that. In fact, let me just share with you and, and help us to refocus just on what Jesus did. The Atlantic Ocean is approximately 41 million square miles. Guess what? He created it. The Pacific is the largest and deepest ocean and covers more than 155 million square miles. Guess what? He created it. The circumference of the earth is approximately about 25,000 miles. Earth is one planet that revolves around the sun, and, there's all, and, and it's 92 million miles away. And yet this morning, we are blessed by the sun rising and seeing it and feeling its warmth. The North Star. I love going out on a cool, crisp night and seeing the stars. And if you haven't done that lately, pause and refocus on the heavenly beings that God has created. The North Star is 323 light years from the earth. And you say, 323 years. No, 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 no. Light years. That, that means the distance that light travels in one year and the distance that light travels in one year is 5.88 trillion miles. And guess who created the North Star? Jesus did. Jesus did. Earth is part of, 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 of one galaxy, the Milky Way. How many of you feel like you're going back to school right now? This is a review. Don't worry, there's no test. Thank you, Jesus. But the Earth, we're part of one galaxy called the Milky Way, and the Hubble's telescope shows and reveals to scientists that there's over 100, approximately over 100 billion other galaxies besides the Milky Way. Guess who created that? Jesus did. He is such a powerful, almighty God. Refocus on what he did. Is your mind blown yet? What did Jesus do? He created everything. Everything that we see and everything that we don't see. John chapter 1 and verse 3. Through him God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. Jesus Christ created everything but even better than that the one who created everything is proclaimed time and time again in scripture the one who created everything is your lord and your savior who created you and loves you that gives me chills that brings me hope that brings me encouragement that a god who created everything loves me and it helps me put my faith in jesus christ it builds my faith knowing that the God of the universe who created everything also created me. And if he created those billions of galaxies, if he created the light that will travel at 5.88 trillion miles, if, if he created the North Star that I can see with my eye that is uh, 323 light years away, if he created the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, if he created all of that, my faith in a God who is able to do that should let me know that he can take care of my situation and my problems. So when you're going through a challenging season and this is where we apply this 
If you're here and you're, or you're watching online and you're going through a difficult time in life, if you're going through a difficult season, if you feel like that God, you know, he knows your situation, but is he capable and is he able of taking care of it? When you're going through those challenging seasons of life, just refocus on what we just shared. Refocus on what Jesus did. He is the creator of everything. Think about that. He created everything seen and unseen. And if he's that powerful, then we need to trust and believe that he can take care of me. Because I'm more precious than the North Star. You're more precious than the North Star. You're more precious than the sun. You're more precious than anything else that Jesus has created. You know why? That's not an arrogant statement. I'm just echoing what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. I love how the message puts it. He puts this, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you? Think about it. All the wildflowers that are beginning to bloom because it's springtime, I'm not talking about weeds. All right? We know that we're more precious than weeds. But I'm talking about the wildflowers that have been planted, and they just come, and it's beautiful. And we look at that, then it should encourage us that the God who created everything that we see and everything that we don't see, if he cares for that wildflower, and most of them aren't even going to be seen, then how much more will he take pride in me and take care of me? He loves you. And so take a moment and refocus on what Jesus did. He created everything. And I love how God puts it. He looked and saw what he created. When he looked at man and he looked at woman, he said, not only are they good, they're very good. Come on, encourage somebody. Say, you know what, you're very good. If you want to encourage them even more, say, you're very good looking. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll have an altar call for repentance here later. He shaped everything. And the second thing that we see is not only that he shaped everything, but Jesus, what did he do? He surrendered everything. He surrendered everything. Look at Colossians chapter 16, the second part. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him. And look at this, for him. Not just created through Jesus Christ, but everything that was created was created for him. You were created for him. For his enjoyment, for the relationship, for, for that communion. All, everything that he created, he said, it's good. It was pleasing to his eye. He was satisfied. He was content for everything was created, not just through him, but everything was created for him. And the words, things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world, it, it seems to really bring into mind that there's a hierarchy of angelic beings, thrones, and powers, or rulers, and authorities. And, and it really indicates a highly organized dominion in the spiritual world. What we have to understand as, as believers in Jesus Christ is there, there's a natural world, it's things that we see, but there's also a spiritual world or a spiritual realm, things that we cannot see. And there's battles raging, there's dominion, uh, d uh, dominion over certain territories that are being, being battled for and, and, and war, waging war in the heavenlies, and, and, and we don't have time to unpack that, but you have to understand that while we are spiritual beings living in a, a, a physical body, there is a spiritual realm that we cannot see with our physical eyes, but we see it through the Spirit. And we see that these thrones and powers and rulers and authorities, they were all created through him. But in verse 15, I want you to get this, he is supreme over all creation. He is supreme over all creation. Those things that we see and those things that we can't see. And this is what Paul is trying to teach us today. Everything that he created, he is supreme over everything he created that we see. But then he says he's also supreme over those things we cannot see. Every angelic dominion he created, but it's also supreme over it. 
In fact, if you go back to Matthew chapter 28, this isn't in your notes, but Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus tells his followers, I have been given all power and authority in heaven and earth. Now, I want you to capture this. If he had been given all power and all authority in heaven and earth, when he came to earth, he gave up his authority. He gave up his authority. We're going to look at this next week in our Easter message, but, but Jesus Christ didn't go rogue. He was following the plan of his heavenly Father. When he came to earth, Pilate said, Do you not know that I have the power to either set you free or keep you and crucify you? And Jesus made this statement, The only power that you have is the power that my Father gives to you. And yet... He surrendered that authority and that power so that he would be hung on a cross and mocked and die for you and me. He surrendered everything. He surrendered it all. He had the power. He had all authority in heaven and in earth because he's supreme over all creation. And so when you begin to understand this, Jesus surrendered everything. He surrendered everything. No power, no ruler, no authority could ever overpower him unless he willingly surrendered everything to follow the plan of the Father. Let me just share with you, and I, and I want you to understand, we cover a lot of scriptures because I figure the Bible has a whole lot more to say than I do. And so let me just share with you, in John chapter 10, look at all these different places where Jesus is reminding us that he surrendered everything so that he would follow the plan of the Father and he would ultimately be sacrificed. John chapter 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices or surrenders his life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice or I surrender my life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 17, the father loves me because I sacrifice or I surrender my life so that I may take it back again. John chapter 10, verse 18, are you getting the points? John chapter 10, verse 18, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it or I surrender it voluntarily for I have the authority. Look at this. He has the authority to lay it down when I want and also take it up again. So if he has all power and all authority and heaven and earth and yet he's following the plan of the heavenly father so you and I can be reconciled with him, he is surrendering everything so that he can become the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have a relationship with God the Father. What did Jesus do? He surrendered everything. He willingly surrendered everything to do, to come to earth and become the sacrificial lamb. And I believe when we refocus on that, it brings a sense of thankfulness, a sense of devotion to someone who has laid down their life, who has given up everything so that I can live. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 and 8 says, Though he was God, speaking of Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He surrendered that. Look at this. Instead, he gave up or he surrendered his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Why? Because Jesus Christ surrendered everything. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. If you continue in our passage this morning in Colossians, in chapter 1, in verse 20, the second part, Paul says once again, and look at this, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. How could God make peace with everything? Because Jesus Christ was willing to surrender everything. You and I have the opportunity to be reconciled with our Heavenly Father because Jesus Christ surrendered everything. So the one who created everything... And everything that was created for him surrendered everything so that he could become the sacrifice that was needed so that we could be forgiven of our sins. So, lesson number one, what did Jesus do? Say it with me. He shaped everything. Second thing, what did Jesus do? He surrendered everything. And thirdly, he suffered everything. He suffered everything. 
Now, today's Palm Sunday, and this is Holy Week. We're, we're, we're focusing on, and I hope that you will take time during your prayer time to read the account of that week's events leading up to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This coming Friday, we'll come together and we will remember and reflect on what Jesus went through as we celebrate Good Friday in our service at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, as we come in, in, our, in our prayer time, we, we, we always worship, I share a devotion, and, and we're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit right now. I invite you to come, and we pray. If you wrote your prayer request on that, on that communication card, guess what? Every Wednesday night, unless it's marked confidential, there are about 60 people that come on Wednesday night for our prayer service, and you have 60 people lifting your name up in prayer. If, if you just need to pick me up, Come to our Wednesday prayer service because not only do we worship, but we look at the word and we spend time praying. It's, and in fact, people, people have told me, Wednesday night prayer service is my favorite service of the whole week. Because it's just a lift, it's, it's a pick-me-up. And so we are, this Wednesday, we are praying, and we have been praying for this coming weekend Easter events. Our Good Friday service, Saturday night celebration Easter service and we'll have those two identical services Saturday night and Sunday morning but this week during Holy Week I want us to remember what Jesus suffered for you and for me Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19 for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ you see Jesus was born in human flesh but God the Father was pleased to live in him Look at this because I'm going to connect the dots here in just a moment. But look at this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. So then, since we, as believers in Jesus Christ, since we have a great high priest, speaking of Jesus Christ himself, who has entered heaven, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. So hold firmly to what we believe. Verse 15. This high priest of ours, and who's the high priest? Jesus this high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same testings we do yet he did not sin I want you to grasp this he surrendered everything and he suffered everything everything we just read in Hebrews that every testing every temptation every heartache that we go through here on earth Jesus has suffered the same thing he said, well, he's God. He can handle it. He was human. He still was hurt physically and emotionally. And so you, you began to see in verse 15, he faced all the same testings that we do. And then if you back up in chapter 2 and verse 18, the Hebrew writer once again says, since he himself, speaking of Jesus, has gone through suffering and testing... He is able to help us when we are being tested. I want you to capture this and catch this. Jesus Christ suffered everything and was tested with everything. Why? So that you and I would have somebody that would know exactly what I'm going through. I, many of you know that my brother was killed when I was a teenager. And so when someone loses a sibling, especially for me, and of course for my parents, when someone loses a child, they can relate. They can relate. I can relate to anybody who has lost a, a brother or a sister. I, I can relate to that. But I want, you to, I want you to understand this. Even though I have walked in that, in that line, in that testing, in that suffering, you know, yours still may be a little bit different than mine. It, it, I mean, I know, you know, oh, I know what you're going through. No, not really. You can come close, but you may not know exactly what I'm going through. That's not the case with Jesus. We just read, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, why did he go through suffering and testing? So that he is able to help us, us, all of us, when we are being tested. Jesus knows exactly what I went through when I lost my brother. He knows exactly what you went through when you lost your sibling. Different circumstances, 
Mine was a drunk driver that hit my brother head on. Yours may have been some type of terminal illness. We still lost siblings, but they were different. They were different. But Jesus had suffered all things so that he could help me go through my testing. Does this make sense this morning? This is what Jesus did. This is what he did. He went through suffering and testing in every way so that when we go through suffering and we go through testing, he says, I know exactly what you're going through. And it's not just empty words. Jesus went through these things so he's able to help us when we're going through suffering and testing. And we know that Jesus suffered physically. We know that what he, the brutal death that he went through, but I want you to understand, he understands and knows what you're going through in every season of suffering and testing. There's other ways besides his physical crucifixion that Jesus suffered. He suffered in temptation in the wilderness. In fact, if you do a study on, on the temptation in the wilderness, there's three, three areas that Jesus was tested that you and I are tested with more than once. He was tempted physically by the appetite. Turn these rocks, turn these, turn these stones into bread. This week, we're going through fasting. Guess what? Somebody's going to bake you some chocolate chip cookies. Someone's going to ask you out to eat at a steakhouse, and you may be, you, you know, this week you may be following the Daniel plan where you're not going to eat meat, and, and they're asking you out to Ruth's Chris. If anybody wants to know where I love to get a good steak, hint, hint. But, but, I, I, but that's what happens. We are tested in our appetites. Jesus already was. We're, we're tempted with power. Jesus was tempted with power. He was tempted with praise. Oh, if you, you are the son of God, and you can throw yourself off this temple, and the angels will come and capture you. I mean, all of these things in all three areas that Jesus was tempted and tested, you and I have been tempted and tested as well. So we see that he suffered and he was tested in the wilderness. Jesus was also accused of being demon-possessed. Have you ever been? <laughs> I, I mean, think about it. Then his own brothers, his own family didn't believe in him and thought he was out of his mind. Mark chapter 3 and verse 21. Man, that dude's lost it. Somebody needs to talk to him. The Garden of Gethsemane, loneliness and stress. He was betrayed by one of his followers that he had poured three and a half years into. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. He was secretly arrested at night. And he had not committed one crime. Arresting a person at night was not, was not kosher. It wasn't real. It wasn't supposed to take place. And yet, he went through a kangaroo court, if you will. False accusations, lies said about him. He was mocked and ridiculed by his own people. John chapter 1, verse 11 and 13. Peter, the guy who said he would never leave him. Oh, everybody else is going to leave you, but I'll never. I'm going to be with you, Jesus, no matter what comes our way. He was the first one to deny him. Physically, he suffered and died. So how could Jesus suffer everything and not sin? I want you to capture this. How could he suffer everything and not sin? You say, well, he was God. Yeah, I understand he was human, but he was God. I believe the answer is found in Colossians verse 19, chapter 1. For God in all his fullness was pleased, look at this, to live in Christ. God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And can I just share with you that if we will allow God's fullness to live in us, then whatever temptation, whatever test, whatever suffering, it doesn't mean we won't suffer and it wasn't, won't mean that we won't go, th go through stressful situations. It doesn't mean that we won't feel lonely because Jesus felt every one of them. But if we, if we truly believe that Jesus is our example, then we must say, Lord, just like you lived in your son Jesus Christ to the full and you were pleased to live in him and he was able to overcome every suffering, every testing and every temptation, then God, I want you to fully 
live in my life so that I can overcome every suffering and every temptation. Come on, church. If God lives inside of you, you can overcome any suffering and testing that comes your way. I believe that we can go through the, and we will. Come on, how many has gone through suffering and testing at least once? And the reason why you've, you're on the other side is because the Spirit of God is living in you. In fact, through every testing and every suffering, Jesus can help us overcome that suffering and testing. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Surely you know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he says you are God's temple. And God's Spirit lives in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and 11. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you. Verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. That's a wonderful promise. That if that same spirit that lived in Christ and that raised him from the dead, if it can do that for Jesus, then what the writer is saying, it will, he will do it for you as well. If that same spirit lives in you and dwells in you, then God will give life to your mortal body. So refocus on what Jesus did. He shaped everything. He surrendered everything. And he suffered everything simply for you and for me. How many thankful for that this morning? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. He's the creator of everything. He shaped everything. And a God who has shaped and created everything. For him to know what I'm going through. And he's not only knowing what I'm going through, he has been through it. And he's not only been through it, but he comes alongside of me to help me walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And while I'm walking through that valley of the shadow of death, David says, I will fear no evil. Whatever the enemy brings, you don't have to be afraid. And so during this Easter season, during this Easter season, we do need to refocus on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I believe that. But I believe that even more so, we need to remember and refocus all that Jesus did, not just during the Easter season, but every single day of our lives. We need to refocus on all that he has done. All that he has done. And when we think about all he's done, we need to give him thanks. We need to give him praise. There's a, there's a song that we used to sing. When I think about the Lord, how he raised me how he saved me, how he healed me to the uttermost, and he filled me with the Holy When I think about the Lord, when I think about him, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you refocus on what Jesus did? So, Father, we come to the end of this teaching and worship. And now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you Speak to our hearts. What do you want us to do? How do you want me to respond, Holy Spirit, to what we have just heard today? And that's what we want to pray. I want you just to take your notes out, if you will. And I want you to, uh, and if you don't have a pen or if you're taking notes on your phone, I want some somehow borrow a pen from somebody grab an offering envelope out of the one of the trays. But if you wouldn't mind, I want you to write down five things that Jesus has done for you. Just write down five things that Jesus has done for you. It could be this past week. It could be over your lifetime. Just write down five things that Jesus has done for you. If you're watching online, I'm going to ask you to do the same. Just write down five things that come to mind. I know there's more than five. 
I'm just asking you to write down five things that Jesus has done for you. Have you got them? Here in a moment, we're going to have our prayer partners come because I, I know in a crowd this size and even online that there are people that are going through some testing, some temptation, and even suffering. And you know that we, we love praying for people because we believe that prayer makes a difference. And prayer doesn't always give us the answer right at that moment. Sometimes it's a process, and, and that's fine. We believe in, in praying but we have seen people healed instantly. I don't know how all that works, to be quite honest with you. I don't know why an answer comes sometimes instantaneously and then sometimes it takes a little bit. But I do know this, we never give up. We keep turning to God. And so here in a moment, for those that need prayer, and I hope that you will always feel comfortable coming and allowing us the privilege of praying with you, if you need healing in your body, if you, if you need wisdom for a decision in your life, whatever it may be, if, if whatever, whatever it is, we, we want to pray with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know one of the biggest things that he did, well, the biggest thing he did is he died for you. He died for you and he rose again. We're going to celebrate that. And so if you're like, I want to start this spiritual journey, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ, I want you to come and just, with those that are going to be up here at the front, say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And they'll answer any questions that you have. We have material that we want to give to you because we believe in taking care of people and helping them and partnering with them along this spiritual journey. But if you have a prayer request and you would like for us to pray, we're going to do that. But at the same time, here in a moment, when I ask you to stand, our prayer partners will begin to come. And if you need prayer for anything, we're going to ask you to come and, and, and just stand along the front. And, and the rest of us, if we're not coming forward for prayer, we're going to take this list. And the worship team is going to be singing. So, so I, I want you to begin thanking Jesus for what he's done. I, I want you just to begin. Thank you, Jesus, for... for whatever you put down those five things because before we leave I want him to know that we know what he's done and so are you ready if you need prayer we want you when we stand I want you to come prayer partners are going to be coming with you but then we're just going to be we're just going to be give God praise and give him thanks okay so the worship team's going to be singing don't feel obligated to sing I want you to feel obligated to give thanks and praise to what Jesus has done all right, are you ready? On three, we're going to do this. One, are you ready? Two, be ready to move if you want prayer. Three, come on, let's stand up and let's begin to give praise. We're, prayer team, if you wouldn't mind to come, if you need special prayer, if you desire someone to pray with you, I want you to come and step out. Give us the privilege of praying with you this morning. Okay, church, those that are watching online, I want you to look at that list. And I want you to begin to give thanks and give praise for what Jesus has done all across this building. Come on, let's begin to give him praise. Begin to open up your mouth. Jesus, I'm thankful. I am thankful for what you've done in my life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my family that you have blessed me with. Lord, I'm undeserving of the family that you have placed me in, but I am so grateful for that. Jesus, I'm thankful for this church. God, I'm undeserving. I'm so undeserving to pastor such a great people. But Lord, I thank you for what you've done. Jesus, I thank you for healing my body. When I was a young child and I was sick, I thank you that you touched my foot. And Lord, I thank you that you corrected it and that I walk normally today. Jesus, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you did. Come on, church, just begin to give thanks for what Jesus has done in your life. Begin to praise him. Begin to give him glory and thank him for all that he's done. Begin to refocus. Begin to reflect. Begin to remember all that Jesus did and has done in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Again, thank you so much for joining us online at the Assembly. We hope this message encouraged you and we would love to stay connected. So be sure to click the link below and contact us. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday.